This talk is about hunting through RDP data, and we'll get into what I mean by hunting later in the presentation. Um, but I kind of want to get some quick introduction style things out of the way first. If we haven't met before, I'm Josh Liberti. Um, like Jeanette said, I'm a senior consultant on the CrowdStrike professional services team. Um, before I started working at CrowdStrike, I did large-scale detection at a Fortune 5 company. And I think most important to this conference is that I've been a Bro user for just over two years now, using it in production, doing large-scale detection. Um, and I focus primarily on network forensics and incident response. So it's kind of good to, to keep that in mind uh, as a scope for the rest of this presentation. This isn't like deep dive into any protocol analyzers. This is you know an overview and how you can use it to find bad stuff in your network. Uh, if you Twitter and you want to connect with me, my handle is my name without vowels in it. It's the best way to get in contact with me. Uh, and these are the goals that I'd like to achieve with this talk. Uh, I know one of these will definitely happen. But hopefully you'll learn something new about RDP, possibly something you know, that's very useful to you. Uh, you're definitely going to see one of uh, the newest bro analyzers in action. And I'm really hoping that you leave with some useful methods to find bad guys in your network if you look for bad guys in your network. Um, so I have 50 slides to get through. So we're just going to jump right into it. Um, here's some key points you need to keep in mind for this presentation. I didn't want to give everyone an overview of what RDP is, because I assume most users are familiar with it. You probably use it. Um, but the three things you need to know, uh, what it does, right? It enables remote system access across your network. Uh, the connection is encrypted. That's really important for this talk. Keep that in mind. And it's definitely being used in your organization, whether you think it is or not. So why am I talking about this? Um, Bro24 has an RDP analyzer. If you didn't know, you know now. Um, and if you've been using the beta or actually run Bro24 in production, you may have RDP logs that you haven't looked at yet. Um, and this is one of the reasons why this analyzer exists, um, not specifically because of Samurai Panda and I don't want to get into the development talk of like building the analyzer, but it exists to detect attackers moving laterally throughout your network. It's RDP sessions are one method of, of doing that, right? When they get, get into your network, they're going to move around. They're going to see what systems they can connect to. Uh, other common methods and tools that attackers are going to use for lateral movement, SMB shares, remote Windows management instrumentation, and PowerShell. Um, those could all be individual talks on how to detect that on the network. This one is just about RDP. So uh, before we get to the fun stuff, you know, we kind of need to talk about some high-level details of the protocol to, to get you guys on point. Uh, if you can read this chart, that's everything that happens over TCP when an RDP connection happens. Um, from an analyst incident responder perspective, we care about a very small part of it. Uh, we actually only care about the first two phases of the sequence, connection initiation and basic settings exchange. So what I'll do now is kind of walk you through some of the data you can expect to find in each of those sequences and the PDUs that are contained in there. So the first uh, PDU in the connection in initiation phase is a connection request from the client to the server. Uh, how it works, like I said, not totally important. You probably want to know what data is being sent from the client to the server. So the client sends the security protocols for RDP that it supports. It uh, also sends a correlation identifier, which is used internally in the protocol just to keep track of the connection to the server. Um, and very useful to not only the protocol, but also incident responders is this optional routing token or cookie. Uh, typically, that's used to identify a user. It's a good user fingerprint. The second PDU of the connection initiation phase is a connection confirmation from the server to the client. Uh, server responds, and it's basically saying, yes or no, did you accept the connection? So if yes, it responds and says, OK, well, we selected this protocol, and we'll use that for the connection. Um, if it's unsuccessful, the server will respond and say why it failed. The second sequence that's actually interesting to us, and it's probably the most interesting of, of the four that I'll be talking about, is the first uh, PDU of the basic settings exchange. It's the MCS Connect Initial PDU. So in here, the client sends some of its basic settings data to the server. Uh, it sends its computer name. It sends the keyboard language settings it's using. And it sends the version of RDP that it's running, so the client software. Server responds with similar data. 
Um, so this is the second PDU of the basic settings exchange. It says, OK, well, this is the version of RDP that the server is running. It uh, responds with the encryption method and level that it chose for the connection. And it sends um, some server certificate information that we don't actually use in the analyzer, but it's available if you want to look at it. Uh, after this, things get a little problematic um, because you run into this. So every sequence phase that follows, and if you, if you could read the chart, there were 10 in total. We're only looking at the first two in the analyzer. The other eight are all encrypted. So the sequence encryption is just one small challenge that we have to deal with among many challenges with this protocol. Encryption is uh, a big problem, not just for those other eight phases being encrypted, but um, so if you, if you don't have a cookie and the server, so let's say in an RDP transaction, the client connects to a server and the server responds and says, I would like to use SSL, a secure connection for this. Um, bro, the analyzer will actually tell you that, that the server is going encrypted if it saw a cookie. If, it, if Bro never saw the cookie, so the cookie doesn't exist, remember it's an optional field value in the connection setup, then Bro couldn't identify the traffic as RDP. So Bro doesn't know that it's RDP, if that makes sense. So no cookie means no identifiable packet data. Uh, Bro just treats it as SSL traffic. Your best guess at that point that it's RDP might be that it's operating off of a standard port. Um, but it is nice that the uh, analyzer will flag it if a cookie is seen. The other problem is data availability. Um, and this is especially a problem for incident responders because most of the forensically useful information is optional to the protocol. So the client, when they connect, they don't have to send a cookie, which is usually a username. When the client connects, they don't have to send their computer name. Um, you can kind of get around this issue, but this is really the key data that ties this protocol into the activity on your network. Um, that makes it useful when you're in investigating incidents. And these are going to come up a lot later in examples. Uh, cookies are, um, by themselves, they cause a lot of problems. Um, so what's interesting is that cookie lengths all have a, they have a range of lengths, essentially. Um, typically, what you'll see is a length of nine if you're just looking at the data on the wire. Um, and that's because the client software will truncate whatever the cookie value is to nine characters, depending on what version it is. Um, some go up to 127 characters. A lot of the Mac and Linux RDP software will, will use the full range. Um, so then you get the whole user. But the problem that this causes uh, is something that I call user collision. And it's actually a problem for the protocol and an analyst reviewing the data. Uh, and the problem is that if it's truncated, multiple users will appear to be the same user. And there's a pretty simple example here at the bottom. Um, we have two users, Samantha and Sally. Um, these are their, their usernames, so domain slash Samantha, domain slash Sally. And on the wire, this is recorded as domain slash SA, domain slash SA. So in, with, with the absence of any other data from the RDP connection, you'll know the, you have the flow data, essentially, you know, the source IP, destination IP, the ports they used. And the cookie, maybe, if it's there. But if the cookies look like this, Samantha and Sally will look like the same user. Uh, this is a problem, and you're going to need more data to corroborate, like, who is who. And sometimes you can use the IP address for that. Sometimes you can't. So up to this point, I've kind of talked about data that's sent over the protocol and some of the challenge that the protocol poses. Um, but I think before we jump into you know, hunting through the data and identifying bad stuff, what we should do is we should you know, talk about what it looks like on the wire. And so we're going we're gonna to do that. Um, and we're also going to talk about what problems exist of just looking for RDP data on the wire. So this is just raw RDP data. This is uh, the first two sequences that I described earlier, full sequences. Um, and this is ngrep output of, of the session. So essentially, this is everything we care about, right? Because everything after this is always going to be encrypted, and it's not forensically useful to you. And if you look at this and you have a detection mindset, you've written signatures in Snort or Suricata, written bro scripts, you're probably seeing some things in this raw output 
that are flags that it's RDP activity. You know, ignoring the port, right, 3389. Uh, the first thing, already discussed, the cookie. This is the field for the cookie. This is just a static string that you can search for in the data to identify it. It's always gonna be the same. The tokens are different, but this is usually the way you identify users. Uh, this string, Duca, is hard-coded into the MCS Connect initial PDU. You can always rely on it being there, assuming that the server didn't respond with an encrypted protocol. Uh, also at the bottom, you may have noticed, there are these strings that have this, the strings that have the string RDP in it. These are plugins for the RDP session. Um, if you've ever looked into these, or if you didn't know, maybe you'll know now, that RDP-DR is for printer redirection over RDP. RDP-SND is for sound, and clip-RDR is for the clipboard. So you can kind of make some assumptions about what functionality the RDP session has by the presence of those strings. Uh, and then the last uh, packet there at the bottom is the server response. Uh, well, the server settings exchange, excuse me. Um, and that MCDN string is hard-coded into the PDU as well. So those are all great ways to identify RDP. If you're just working with packet data, if you don't have an analyzer, if you just want to run strings or ngrep against, against it, you can find it like that. Um, <clears throat> if you've written or seen bro scripts before, this syntax is probably going to look familiar. This is one way I identified or tried to identify RDP um, using pr previous versions of Bro. So anything that's Bro 2.3 and you know prior. Uh, just to go top to bottom of what is actually happening here. So anytime a uh, connection is being removed from Bro, we inspect the destination port for RDP's standard port 3389 and check to see that the originator and responder both send at least a thousand bytes in the payload. Uh, there are a lot of problems with, with uh, detecting RDP this way, and it doesn't work for quite a lot of reasons. Um, the biggest being you're only inspecting the standard port. RDP tends to not, so it is the common port for RDP, but you're, you are going to see it over non-standard ports. And so if you identify it like this, you'll totally miss it. Uh, this is another way to actually detect RDP um, with Bro 2.3 and under and it's actually the DPD signature for RDP in Bro 2.4. So as I was building this presentation, I realized this could be used to identify RDP in prior versions of Bro. The problem is when you go to enable RDP, you're not gonna enable anything. You'd need to work with the payload in script land and that's a mess that you don't wanna deal with. Um, if, you're, if you can read it, it's coming across pretty big. You can see the, the strings we identified in the raw packet output. So cookie, MSTS hash, Duca, all the plugins that may be there. And then the, uh, also, the, so the first signature requires the server to respond with a variable, you know, MCDN is a popular one that you're gonna see. So if, if, bro, if this analyzer, analyzer didn't exist in Bro24, you have a lot of problems with identifying RDP from a detection and incident response scenario, right? The, the first problem is your network detection for this isn't useful like whatsoever because RDP is a normal part of enterprise activity. Like if you want to write a snort or suricata signature to detect RDP, go for it, but you're going to have tons of alerts to go through and you're not going to know what happened in the connection. The other, so, so leading into the next one, the other problem is that the detection, that detection doesn't scale when you actually consider the time it takes to review that data. So let's say you do have an IDS signature or even the bro signature from the previous slide without the analyzer. Um, what your best bet is if you have full PCAP, you pull it, or partial PCAP, you pull it, and you analyze it locally or on, a, on an analysis server. Uh, the problem with that is that, once again, RDP happens so often you're gonna be spending a lot of time pulling PCAP, reviewing PCAP, and finding out that it's just benign, normal user activity. So ultimately what that means is you, detecting RDP on the network wastes time. Like it's not useful to do at all. Um, but with the analyzer in Bro24, I think we've solved a lot of those problems. 
So if you've been, if you can read the session data that was in the previous slides, uh, the data here is going to look really familiar. So this is the uh, truncated or partial output from the RDP log from that session. So you get the cookie, which is a username, so it's A767, the keyboard layout of that client system, English United States, that's actually a conversion, it's not in plain text in the packet, the RDP build number, so the software, the uh, client computer name, the width and height of that session, uh, the result, which was successful, the security protocol that the server and initially or uh, eventually decided upon and the connection runs over, and the encryption level and method. Um, so there are some caveats with all of that stuff that you just saw. Uh, this analyzer is not magic. It's not going to detect RDP over SSL or SSH. And that's important to know because if you, if you consider that you probably typically monitor activity at the edge of your network, um, attackers are gonna tunnel RDP on the edge. So it's probably gonna be tunneled over SSH. So you're never gonna know that it was RDP. It'll just look like an SSH session. Um, which means that this is actually most useful when you monitor internal sites. And if you don't do that, you maybe wanna think about doing that. Um, identifying you know, uh, high priority projects within your organization and monitoring the links to those projects and sites. Uh, the other big caveat that I think may or may not result in a log output change for this is that success, so as a result, does not mean that the client successfully authenticated. What it means is the server successfully took the client connection initiation and said, okay, well, I'm not gonna outright reject this. Let's see what other data you have. So the client could still fail the login after that. Uh, and all that means is you need more data to validate what happened. You need to know, you know if the host successfully authenticated to the target system or not. And to do that, you, you need non-network data. You could identify it based on the size of the flows going back and forth between the systems, but if you want evidence, you have to go to the endpoint. Okay, so the whole point of this presentation, let's talk about RDP hunting. <clears throat> and to, to, to start this off, we kind of need to know what hunting is or what I think it is. Um, so this is my definition. Um, it's a proactive approach to identifying threats on your network. Um, and that means you're not waiting for an alert to come in. You're not using intelligence given to you by a third party organization. You're actually going into your data and you're looking for bad guys where you think they may be. Uh, and it, it gives you the opportunity to identify new types or new variants of threats. So you're gonna, probably gonna find things you didn't know existed. Um, and that's, it's a really great way to learn more about your environment. Uh, so there, there are a lot of things that affect your ability to hunt. And I don't think this is in order. Some of these might be moved around, but it's gonna, the things that are gonna affect your ability are knowledge of your network and your organization, your skill set, your tool set, and unfortunately, your leadership will probably affect your ability to do this. <clears throat> and so here's an even quicker note on RDP metadata in regards to the hunting, is that you have to hunt through it because IOCs aren't gonna help you because you're monitoring internal sites. You don't wanna put you know, an internal IP address in your IOC list. And IDS alerts, you know, like I previously described, they're gonna waste your time. You don't wanna know every time RDP happened because you'll see RDP everywhere. You just want to know when it happened, when an attacker had control of one of your machines. Um, so these are some hunting methods I use when I'm looking at bro data. Uh, big caveat here is that they work for me and there are many ways to do this. Um, this is just my verbalization of what I do. So top to bottom, stacking is either simple or complex outlier analysis. You're essentially looking for what doesn't fit in your organization. Uh, tracking is using inside knowledge to identify attacker activity. Um, the hope here is that you know just as much or more about your network as the attacker does, um, because if you do, then you can look for them in places that they're likely to be. 
and we're going to talk. We're going to go through examples of these as well. If that's not clear. Uh, and then timelines, right? You're monitoring activity across a distinct range of time. So you're inspecting data points over time to identify or act, identify act, attacker activity. And this is where we kind of get into the examples of these. Um, and you're going to see heavy use of both the cookie and the client name field here. So with simple stacking, I think uh, tools as, as, uh, as simple as BroCut work pretty well for this, um, assuming you have local data and no other tool to work with. You don't need to script anything. You can just, you just use BroCut. Um, but you can identify new users and computers in the network with this. So pretty simple. You inspect the cookie or the client name field, sort it, unique it, sort it, and then you get a stacked list of the users and the computers in your network and how many times you saw them in RDP logs. Um, complex stacking is a little more complex. I use Splunk because I, I like Splunk and all the organizations I've worked for have used Splunk. But you can feel free to translate all the examples of detecting this activity into your tool of choice or a Python script or whatever you want. Um, so for this, primary use would be identifying scanning and worms and compromised user accounts. Um, to take the first example, if you want to identify a scanner or a worm, um, you basically want to stack the number of unique target servers against the cookie value. So you're looking for one user to authenticate or connect to lots of target servers. This example is going to come up later um, at the end of the presentation as well. For compromised user accounts, you can look at both the client name, so the client computer name, and the cookie field. And what you're looking for are multiple users on the same computer. So you need to, once again, this is you know the huge caveat here is that you need to know your environment to really make a determination on if this is bad or not. This could be totally normal activity, but you would need to verify that with the users to say, okay, well, were you on Sally's computer or were you on Samantha's computer when this happened? This one is, so the tracking example is really hard to communicate, I think unless you actually have like a good case study for it. Um, but the primary use would be identify lateral movement, which is the huge goal with this analyzer. Um, it comes with some pretty stiff dependencies, though. So you need to know your network and your organization at least a little. Like you can't, you can't not know anything about your network or organization. And I, I have examples of those to follow this. Um, but not only do you need to know that stuff? You need that data to be accessible and organized to you while you're hunting. So you, it's not enough to just know that you know this is a subnet for this business, this is a subnet for another business. That data has to be accessible to you either in your tool or in a script. You need to make, make use of it. So, so here's a scenario. Uh, you have a sensor that's monitoring traffic between two business units, X and Y. And you know net block B belongs to business unit X, net block C belongs to business unit Y. Um, and based on some of the patterns you've been seeing over the past month, you know RDP between the two business units is a little uncommon. Um, but you also have some organizational knowledge. So you know that business unit Y develops high value projects for your company. So what does that mean? It means that attackers are likely to target business unit Y. So let's identify users accessing abnormal sections of the network. This makes uh, a lot of use of, so I use Splunk tags quite a lot. And that's what this does. So we're looking for users. So we're looking at the cookie field. We're inspecting only traffic from sensor A. And we're looking for the originator or the responder to be in both. So the originator has to be in netblock B. The responder has to be in netblock C. Or the originator has to be in netblock C and the responder has to be in netblock B. You're essentially just monitoring the traffic between the two, right? And so the hope here is that you know enough about your business to make a determination that you want to monitor for this activity, and you do it, and when you see something that shouldn't be there, you escalate it and talk to a user. You can do it uh, pretty easily for computers as well. Um, like I said, the problem is that the cookie field and the computer field are both optional. So you may have none of those in a connection. You may have one of those in a connection, or you may have both of them. So you probably should uh, have a few different searches that you run if you're trying to identify this activity. So the search is exactly the same. You're just monitoring the activity between the two sites for um, things that stand out as weird. 
and timelines, uh, they're really only, so for me, they're only useful for identifying anomalous access, like off hours access, especially if you know like that at this site, they work from eight to five typically. And it's strange if a user is logging on at midnight or something like that. Um, to make this effective, you, it really depends on how much data you have. Because if you try to timeline all RDP connections for all computers, you're probably not going to have a good time. Uh, you really need a way to, if you have that much data, you need to focus on a single computer. And how you arrive at that computer to focus on in timeline is totally up to you. You can use the previous methods that I just discussed or you know, something entirely different. Um, this is a simple Splunk example of, of time charting uh, the computer name to see when that computer was initiating RDP connections. And so to kind of wrap this up, I wanted to go over a couple case studies, um, just using some of the data that I've seen over the past, uh, maybe this is from like the past month or so of, of general activity. Um, the first one is, is talking about worms or scanners. They're really easy to identify when you're hunting. And the search I had earlier, it does a fine job of, of finding them. You, you look for, like I said, the cookie to a user, essentially write the cookie, to connect to a high number of target systems. Um, it's doubly useful if you can isolate events into periods of time. So user A connected to n number of systems in t minutes. It's a pretty good way to find stuff. And I think this would actually be one of the few cases where um, a bro policy script would be useful using the SumStats framework. So you could just identify scanners and worms automatically. You wouldn't have to actually do this by hand. Um, so this is one week of selected RDP activity. And we, so the, and like I mentioned, the search from slide 34 can identify this. And so we have our cookie values, which we know are usually usernames, um, connecting to a fairly high number of unique targets. Um, the first one is RDP logon screen dot nbin. Second one is OS fingerprint RDP dot nbin. Um, the third one's really interesting. It's administer. There's actually a blank value, which means that it's not that the cookie didn't exist. It's that the cookie field existed and there was nothing in it. And then there's the cookie value A. Um, <clears throat> so depending on your experience, some of these values will probably look familiar to you. Um, and if you didn't know, this is what they are. So this slide is same data from before, but I've just mapped it to a threat, quote threat. Uh, the RDP logon screen and OS fingerprint RDP are Nessus scanners. So that's benign. That's really not that interesting. Um, the third one's interesting because it's an example of a user collision that I talked about earlier where it just so happens that a lot of users have the username administrator when they make RDP connections. So you can't really trust that as a red flag. Um, maybe you can with other data. But if you're just looking for scanning or worms, you can't trust that to be the only thing that tells you that an attacker has access, or has, uh, access to a compromised system or user account. I really am not sure about the blank value. Maybe someone has seen that before and has feedback on that, but I didn't look too much into it. And then the A value is Mordo worm. That's still pretty common. You see that a lot. Um, but what's cool is that um, before, let's say you tried to do this with Snort or Suricata or a static bro script or signature, you'd need a signature for each one of these, right? Or at least some, some logic to account for all four of these cookie values. Where instead, we didn't use any, we didn't do any string identification at all. We just used some simple sorting techniques to identify outliers, um, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> this one is uh, probably, I think, more interesting. Um, and it's way more difficult to identify, right? This is using the example where you know your network at least a little, and you know your organization at least a little, and you're able to identify remote attackers while they're live on your network. Um, once again, I'm going to go back to the point that identifying an inbound attacker over RDP 
with just the metadata, right, which is, is essentially what the log parses, is a really difficult game to win because they usually tunnel. So you usually can't identify it. But if you're going to try, you should really be monitoring, monitoring your VPN nodes. Because if you have compromised user accounts and the attacker logs into the VPN and you're monitoring the link between the VPN node and your internal network, guess what? You're going to see all the attacker, all their metadata. You're going to get their computer name. You're going to get the user they're using to authenticate with. And you're going to get a lot of other interesting metadata that you can use to identify them later, even if they change their tactics. So here's the scenario for this case study. Um, and this is, I mean, this and the previous one are all, is all real data, by the way. Um, single factor VPN, we're dealing with maybe potentially compromised user accounts. So we were able to identify the attacker connecting to the network via the VPN. And we found it by tracking inbound connections between 2 and 12 UTC. Um, the reason for that, you, can, you maybe can guess why. I won't get into it. But what's interesting is, and this output actually comes across pretty well here. This is a truncated or partial output from the RDP log. Some of the data that was collected is pretty interesting. So I've, I've redacted the client name and the product ID for the client machine. Um, I don't think it was in the example earlier. But sometimes you can actually get the product ID of the system that the, the attacker is connecting from, which is pretty cool. Um, it can be useful. Um, but what's interesting about this is that this is over multiple hours, so you know, multiple sessions where the attacker came and then left and then came and then left. What, what's interesting about it is some of this data is changing and some of it isn't changing. So the client name never changed. Every time they came back, they had the same unique client name that stood out as being non-normal for this network. Uh, and so the other thing that didn't change is, or are, the width and the height of the session they connected over, which is pretty weird. Um, that was a useful identifier that they came back. And so it kind of, it kind of leads me to this, this point that some of this data you can't rely on. So you can't rely on them always coming to the, from the same VPN node. So you can't just track, you couldn't just put that VPN node into your bro Intel framework list and always detect on VPN connections from there. That's not going to work for you. Um, what you can rely on was the computer name not changing, the desktop width and height not changing. Um, interestingly enough, we couldn't even rely on them using the same, or at least this, the same parsed version of RDP, because it switched from 7.1 to 5.2 a few times. Um, but we were able to track them primarily based on the client name and then verify it with the desktop width and height. Yes, Seth? In your experience, is that uh, resolution interesting or unique? OK, so if it wasn't picked up, the question is, is the resolution interesting or unique? Um, I think it's interesting and unique if you have some other piece of intelligence data to corroborate it. Um, so like it, if we didn't know that this was an attacker, like if the client name was not there, it wouldn't be interesting or unique. Okay. Um, that's a fairly common resolution? Uh, no, it's not. Okay. But, but it's, a little it's a little unique, but so yeah, so the problem is you can't just rely on that to identify bad stuff because it's kind of like um, searching across all HTTP user agents and looking at the ones that only appear like 10 times. You're going to have like 50 to you know, 10,000 of them, probably, depending on the size of your organization. You can't look at all of them. But it's, it's sort of like a, a good indicator, a, a good partial indicator. Yeah, so it is a good partial indicator of bad activity. And if you, once again, if you're monitoring the VPN nodes, you can totally use client name, desktop width, height as indicators of, of detection if you want to automate this. Um, I wouldn't recommend it because you're not going to get this data most, most of the time, probably, based on where you monitor. But it's possible. Um, and leading into that, since you, you kicked it off, if, we, if anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the question, so the comment was, 
it's um, so so using things that you see when you know an attacker is in your environment, like desktop width, height, these things that maybe aren't useful like in a vacuum, but when you know the attacker is there, you have the intelligence to corroborate it, is a, is a useful thing to monitor. I totally agree. Like if you're active in an incident, um, and you have you know the attacker is active in your environment, coming back, yeah, you can definitely monitor for that. There's a lot of ways you could do it. You could write an extension to the Intel framework to start inspecting cookie values and computer names and desktop width and height. You could just search for it through Splunk, whatever data repository tool you use, yeah. If I heard you correctly, I thought you said that, um, are there any other artifacts available in script land that are useful to you when you're doing this like RDP analysis, is that right? So we make most of the useful artifacts available in the log. Um, for the, so when the client sends data, sends settings data to the server, all of that data is captured in an event that you can query. Um, I think we've made all the useful data available, but it is there if you want to look for it. Okay, I think we're all done. If you guys have any questions after this, just feel free to let me know.